Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and happy Women's History Month. We're so pleased that you're joining us this afternoon for the Sundays at Home program. Throughout the month of March, the National Women's History Museum is paying tribute to the women on whose shoulders we stand while celebrating women's stories and encouraging others to share and remember their own. Author, diplomat, and trained mediator Shireen Dodson states that if we want our girls to benefit from the courage and wisdom of the women before them, we have to share the stories. In that spirit, today's program takes a closer look at the unusual life and accomplishments of Eliza Lucas Pinckney, an entrepreneurial spirit who complicates the many common assumptions regarding the place and power of women in the 18th century. My name is Lori Ann Turgeson, and I serve as the Director of Education at the National Women's History Museum. For those of you who are with us for the first time, welcome. For those of you who have attended a Sundays at Home program before, welcome back, and thank you for your continued support. We thank you for taking the time out of your Sunday to be with us this afternoon. Our special Women's History Month at Sundays at Home programming is co-presented with DC Public Library with generous underwriting support from Time Warner Media. Before we begin, please allow me to go over a few housekeeping items. As always, this presentation is being recorded and will be available on the museum's dedicated YouTube channel in the days following the event. Today's guests are available to answer your questions. So please use the chat feature for any comments that you have during the program and use the Q&A feature on the ribbon at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions that you may have regarding the presentation. You may submit your questions at any time during the presentation. I'm joined today by two very special guests, Dr. Lori Glover, author of Eliza Lucas Pinckney, an independent woman in the age of revolution, whom you'll hear more about momentarily, and Dr. Amy Flugrad Jackish, our moderator for this afternoon's conversation. Amy is an associate professor in the history department at the University of Toledo, where she specializes in the history of early America. She's the author of Brothers of a Vow, Secret Fraternal Organizations and the Transformation of White Male Culture in excuse me, in Antebellum, Virginia, and is currently completing a manuscript on the life of Mary Willing Bird, who owned and ran Westover Plantation in Virginia during the era of the American Revolution. Amy received her PhD in history from the University of Buffalo in 2005. Her teaching and research interests involve exploring historical questions about gender and citizenship, race and slavery, the American South, the founding fathers, masculinity, and antebellum culture and politics. We're grateful to have Amy with us today to guide us in this conversation. Thank you for joining us, Amy. And please also join me in welcoming author Dr. Lori Glover to the screen. Well, thank you very much for having me here today. And I would like, it's my pleasure to introduce my friend, Lori Glover. Um, Dr. Lori Glover is the John Francis Bannon Endowed Chair in the Department of History at St. Louis University. Lori is the author of five books on early American history, including The Fate of the Revolution, Virginians Debate the Constitution, published in 2016 by Johns Hopkins University Press, and The Founders as Fathers, The Private Lives and Politics of the American Revolutionaries, published by Yale University Press in 2014. She's also the co-author with Daniel Blake Smith of The Shipwreck at St. Jamestown, The Sea Venture, Castaways, and the Fate of America. Lori has also co-edited three Southern history essay collections with Craig Thompson Friends. And most recently, Lori and Craig co-edited Reinterpreting Southern Histories, which is published by Louisiana State University Press and was winner of the 2020 Jules and Francis Landry Book Award for Outstanding Achievement in the Field of Southern Studies. Her most recent book, and the one that we are here today to talk about, is Eliza Lucas Pinckney, An Independent Woman in the Age of Revolution, published by Yale University Press in 2020, and winner of the 2021 Best Biography Prize from the Society of Historians of the Early American Republic and the 2020 George C. Rogers Jr. Book Award presented by the South Carolina Historical Society. Welcome, Lori. Well, thank you, Amy, for the intro, and, and uh, thanks for being part of the conversation today. And I, I wanna say hello to my friend, Marty Metzler, who just put in the chat that she's, um, she, she's uh, with us today, and uh, I didn't have Marty. I didn't have time to write back, but hello to you too. <laughs> Welcome, Marty. Okay, so I'm so pleased to be able to talk about your wonderful book, which I have right here by my side. And I wanted you to tell us a little bit about how did you become interested in Eliza Lucas Pinkney. Well, it wasn't hard to get interested in Eliza Lucas Pinkney because she's 
you know, very interesting. Uh, she was born in the Caribbean in the 1720s. When she was a young girl, her parents sent her to um, England for a, an extended education. She left when she was 10. She returned back to their small uh, island home when she was almost a grown uh, young woman. Then the family relocated to um, uh, South Carolina, where she ran plantations, uh, became uh, an entrepreneur, uh, the head of a household. She lived for a time in England, um, and she, she she's a person of great introspection, um, a person of, you know, a, a lot of cruelty. Uh, she was a lifelong slaveholder, um, but a person of great ambition and courage and intrigue, and she wrote her place into history. And so it, it wasn't very hard at all to get interested in her. And I was able to write about her because she wrote about her own life and she and her descendants safeguarded uh, those records uh, over the centuries. Wow, I mean, that's so much that she accomplished during that time period. How, uh, in the 18th century, it seems very surprising. How would a woman, how did she know how to do all those different things that you just mentioned? So I think we think of the 18th century as a man's world. You know, the iconic paintings that are in the Capitol Rotunda, the statues, uh, the sort of, what, na national creation story uh, of the 18th century and the revolutionary period in particular is all about men whose names we know, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, uh, Alexander Hamilton. I, I could go on all afternoon. Um, and so I think we think about that age as a period when women were obscure or silent uh, or disempowered or insignificant. And Eliza's life proved to me that none of that was true. She was a person, again, of great resolve and self-determination. Uh, her father, I think, saw something very special in her when she was a girl. Um, she was... I. I think she was the favorite of his four children. Um, he saw great intellectual promise in her and funded her education. When they moved to South Carolina, he got recalled to a military appointment in the Caribbean. His wife was sick. Eliza was the oldest of the four children. And although she was only 17 years old, he trusted her to manage the family estates. And she did that with a great deal of success which I think sowed in her a great sense of accomplishment, uh, a sense of family responsibility, um, and a, a will to achieve significant things for herself, and especially for her family, the family that she had at the time, and the family that she imagined building and protecting in the future. And so whenever an opportunity presented itself to uh, you know, study indigo cultivation, uh, for, uh, for example. She's quite famous in South Carolina. I, I saw in the chat that um, a member of the Eliza Lucas Pinckney chapter of the DAR from South Carolina is in that meeting. She's well, Eliza Lucas Pinckney is well known for her indigo production. When she saw an opportunity like that, she seized it. She was also, um, I don't know if stubborn's the right word, maybe persistent. Uh, she leaned into challenges, and so when obstacles were thrown in her way or uh, she met difficulties, she um, persevered. Um, and so I think it was education, character, and a commitment to her family that made her resolved to achieve tremendous things. I, I should also add that she was able to achieve those things because as I said before, she was a lifelong slaveholder. And so the wealth that she uh, acquired for her family and the independence that she forged for herself was really built on the scores of people that she and her family enslaved in a colonial, revolutionary, and early national South Carolina. Yes. Now, you just mentioned indigo, and so I was going to ask, one of the things I was going to ask you is you have this fabulous cover for your book here, this beautiful dress, and I know that there were three surviving dresses, and one of them was it dyed with indigo, right? Um, that I was, go ahead, sorry. I was going to say, yeah, that's correct. More about this dress and, and some of the other things about this cover, and 
that I know that you know about this stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there's that old saw, Amy, that you can't judge a book by its cover. But yeah. I think we who write books and care what is on the cover um, know you can actually learn quite a lot from the cover of the book if you look closely. So the book jacket is uh, Indigo Blue. Uh, indigo is not very well known or used today. But in the 18th century, it was one of the most um, important and lucrative dyes in the whole Atlantic world. Before the South Carolinians um, figured out how to commercially produce indigo, the French monopolized most of that market. And Eliza was part of a small group of uh, South Carolina planters. She was the only woman in the group uh, who in the 17, late 1730s and early 1740s began experimenting with commercial production of indigo plants and making of indigo dye. Um, which was used, you know, rich people in the 18th century wore deep purple, um, sailors and soldiers wore a sort of lighter blue, um, and so it, it was a, people dyed their wallpaper blue, uh, they dyed their curtains blue, they had blue dresses, uh, women did, and blue suits, men, so it, it was a really important um, commodity, and Eliza's work in partnership with other planters in South Carolina produced indigo commercially at a really important moment because the dominant crop, which was rice, um, well, I'm not, I don't wanna to get too far in the weeds with this, but they grown rice and marketed rice and there was international turmoil that undercut the viability of the rice market and they were scrambling for um, another crop and Eliza and her cohort uh, seized on indigo. The dress is, that dress is of course golden, is made out of silk uh, silk was another one of, Eliza called it her schemes, different agricultural and entrepreneurial um, efforts she made in South Carolina. Silk Works was another one of those. She wasn't able to make a go of it on a commercial level, but she, the enslaved people that she held produced enough silk on her South Carolina plantation that when she moved to England in uh, the 1750s, she took it with her and had three dresses made in London. Um, one was dyed with indigo, it's lost. I don't know what happened to the blue dress. There is a beautiful salmon and cream dress that is in the um, Charleston Museum in South Carolina. It's, I think the DAR chapter, uh, Eliza Lucas Pinkney DAR chapter raised the funds for its um, preser preservation. And the one that's on the cover is at the Smithsonian. And among the many adventures I had tracking Eliza around the world was I got to go to the Smithsonian and see the dress up close and personal. Yeah, I remember you telling me that. Oh, and the someone from the South Carolina GR, I think, says that is true. So you are correct. So, I, and I believe, maybe you, uh, uh, Nidra, you can confirm this too, but I believe you hired your, your chapter hired the same uh, textiles expert who had um, preserved Washington's uh, Revolutionary War tent, which is on display at um, the Museum of the American Revolution. So that tells you something about the level of excellence that they pursued uh, in uh, preserving uh, this dress. Mm -hmm. She says, I think that's true too. Good. Um, so I know one of my favorite chapters in the book is actually talks about when Eliza Lucas Pinckney is in London and that she, I think, does she, she wears her salmon colored dress, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, when she goes to visit, is it, I always get her name wrong, um, Princess Augustina? Augusta, right? yeah. Augusta, I always say Augustine. I knew I was going to get it wrong. I even wrote it down. Um, but I love that um, that scene in the book, and, and and we've discussed that. And why don't you tell people a little bit more about what happens? It makes her so relatable, I think, for someone who's so fantastic and and um, seems like bigger than life, Eliza Lucas Pinkney, that this would happen to her. So why don't you tell us about that? So the family moved to. Um, to England in the 1750s, she hoped that it was a permanent move. By this time, she's married. She's no longer Eliza Lucas. She's Eliza Lucas Pinckney. She's married to a man who's about 20 years older than her, and they have uh, three small children. He thinks the move is temporary. She thinks the move uh, is permanent. 
But in any event, she was like most colonial Americans in the 1750s and 1760s, completely enthrall of the royal family. So when she got to London, she wanted to meet members of the royal family. George II was still the King of England then. His son had died. And so the woman she met, Augusta, it was called the Dowager Princess. I think that's the title. Some, some royal followers, I am not one, but some royal follower can probably um, jog my memory on that. Uh, the, she was the mother of the future George III. And so Eliza used every contact she could find in London to try and get an audience with um, the royal family, with uh, Princess Augusta in particular. And the family finally got um, an appointment to go and meet her. So she had these three little children. And by the time they got to the palace at, at Kew, they were late. And so they were sent away. So Eliza got to go later on and meet members of the royal family, I think at least two more times. And she gave one of the dresses that she had made um, to the princess. The dress was not just a superficial thing though. The dress was a way of showcasing Eliza's expertise in silk manufacturing and a way to showcase generally the profitability and the significance of colonial South Carolina to the larger uh, empire. So she eventually got her the dress, but the, on the first visit, she wanted to take some birds to the royal family. She thought, if I bring these birds from North America, uh, she knew the Dowager Princess was a botanist, uh, like botany, um, uh, cared about the natural world. And she thought, if I bring these exotic birds from South Carolina, maybe that'll be my entry. And in fact, that did help her gain the audience of the royal family. But when she showed up late, um, the officials, the guards there told her she couldn't see the royal family, but they kept the birds. So one of the sort of most humane moments for me in researching the book was thinking about what it must have been like for Eliza that morning to try and get all those children together to get dressed up in her finest clothes, um, to take those birds that she tended to on an ocean crossing yeah. um, and, and have the birds taken and, and no chance of meeting um, the future King of England and his mother. But again, she was one to let obstacles get in her way. And so she, um, Nevertheless, she persisted. <laughs> well, and that you paint this picture of her, you know, I can just imagine her and, uh, you know, and her enslaved entourage that she brought with her, but carrying these birds uh, across the ocean and all of these dresses and all of these things. And then I'm always late, which Lori knows. And so I could completely sympathize with the idea that you would show up with your three children late, but then to be turned away. Um, and you also mentioned uh, in that chapter about her, she wore these really uncomfortable shoes that almost did her in, which I thought was very funny. Well, um, when, she finally got to, when she finally got to meet the, um, the royal family, you know, the custom was unless you were offered a place to sit, you were to stand. And so even though the princess sat down, Eliza did not have the right to sit. And so she had worn her nicest clothes and shoes, which, you know, then maybe like now, a lot of women have uncomfortable uh, shoes. Uh, and so she, she stood there at attention for a long period of time. And her husband, who adored her, um, saw that she was uncomfortable. And he tried to say to the royal family, well, we've taken up enough of your time, we better go. Um, and they were like, oh, no, 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 stay longer, stay longer. Uh, and so it was a it was, uh, I guess, a bit of a case of um, be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. <laughs> but she was, by the way, she was thrilled despite the discomfort of her shoes um, and a few other awkward moments with the uh, uh, royal family. She was thrilled and she wrote back to all of her friends in South Carolina. And it was, you know, big news in South Carolina that the Pinckneys had met the royal family. And someone just put in the chat, they asked if it was parakeets or painted buntings, but it was painted buntings, right? I think it was, gosh, it's been a while since I wrote that. There was a yellow bird, there was a painted bunting, and there was a um, maybe an 
an indigo bird. I think there was a blue bird. Indigo bunting. Uh, indigo bunting. And then there was another sort of multicolored bird. So one was yellow, one was blue, uh, and one was multicolored. And I just can't think of the name of the, maybe a painted bunting. Is that right, Amy? Painted bunting, indigo bunting. And I think the other one was a warbler, I think you said in the book, but I don't remember. I like birds, so I remember those things. Okay. <laughs> um, so I know that um, just uh, to, this, so this sounds like a biz, it was a business meeting as much as it was a social yeah. you know, meeting. But on something more serious, um, you also described the princess's reaction to her daughter and some of the um, uh, cultural traditions that of an enslavement from South Carolina. She asked Eliza Lucas Pinckney about slavery. And um, it's kind of an interesting conversation it seems that they had. Well, she talked to Eliza a lot about slavery. Um, it, the future King George III met with Charles Pinckney and talked to him about slavery. I mean, I think people in the metropole were um, very curious about racial slavery and curious about what it meant for the larger um, British imperial economy, but also curious about what it meant for the Britons living in North America. So there was a moment, um, the conversation between the two women, despite their wildly different stations in life, um, was wide ranging and, and most of it was comfortable. So they both liked botany. Uh, they both were uh, very devoted mothers. Um, they both had been, you know, sort of um, wayfaring travelers in the early uh, parts of their lives. They were both very well educated. And so, you know, the way Eliza told it, at least, they hit it off. In England, by the mid 18th century, there was a growing movement um, away from wet nurses of having other women um, breastfeed children, especially poor women breastfeed children, because there was some concern that the what the character or the morality of an impoverished person might somehow get into the body of a more um, elite person uh, in infancy through breastfeeding. This, this, of course, is preposterous, but, you know, people in the past believe crazy things like people in the present believe crazy things. So um, the princess asked Eliza if she breastfed her children. And Eliza said she had not been able to, but that everyone in South Carolina used uh, black wet nurses. So enslaved women who had had their own children were forced to stop breastfeeding those children in order to breastfeed the white children of the people that they enslaved. So, you know, there's so much going on in, uh, in that meeting, but um, when the princess heard that, she um, stroked the cheek of Eliza's daughter, her name is Harriet, uh, and she touched her and marveled that her skin tone had not changed as a consequence of that intimate contact. And so I saw in that really um, important things to learn about how people in the 18th century English Atlantic thought about medicine, uh, medical health, uh, how they thought about race, um, and how even though the empire is profiting from racial slavery in the Caribbean, uh, on the mainland of North America, there's, there's a great deal of confusion, um, even in among educated people at the center of power um, in the metropole. So, uh, Eliza wrote a lot about that encounter, and there was a lot in the encounter for me to think about as an historian, so it, it factored heavily um, into the book. I thought that was, a, it, you do a really great job of describing that, and I think that, I mean, it really, it, it's, she's talking about silk and indigo, and indigo dye that have been, you know, that she's used in slave labor to create, and then she has this moment, it shows I think how much maybe they didn't know about, you know, what was happening in the colonies. I, th I think that's absolutely right. Um, and again, it, it was incredible that Eliza wrote so much about that encounter, so much about her life, 
uh, in uh, England really so much about her whole life because you know from trying to piece together the life of Mary Willing Bird that most women in 18th century America did not write their way into history. I mean, we can name a, just a handful of women, Abigail Adams, yeah, I don't know who else to put on the list, not very many women at all. Um, and so, you know, most people who are writing histories of 18th century women are trying to do the detective work that you're doing for Mary Willing Bird. They don't have, you know, scores of very detailed, introspective letters that Eliza wrote and preserved. And, you know, I should say, it's because it's of vital importance the reason I had access to all those materials is because Connie Schultz and a team of scholars at the University of South Carolina created a digital edition, the transcriptions of all of Eliza's writings, as well as the writings of her daughter, Harriet Pinckney Ori, who led a, a fascinating and troubling and important life uh, uh, as well. So, you know, I could read their letters, their recipe books, and recipe books in the 18th century were about food and also about medical cures. Uh, Eliza created personal prayers. Uh, Harriet kept a travel log. Um, so there were all kinds of materials that I had um, in textual materials, but then also dresses to look at, lots of housewares, and several of the homes that Eliza lived in are still standing in South Carolina today. So I could recover a lot of her life uh, and her perceptions. And, and Amy knows she went with me, um, we were in England for a conference one time and, and we went by to see one of the houses that Eliza lived in in London. So um, it, it, was, it was quite a lot of fun to track her around the world, even if, you know, the with the pervasive presence of slavery, it was also deeply troubling. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it just shows the deep, the Atlantic reach of slavery as well, that, you know, on all the things that you described in the book, I think you do a really good, great job of contextualizing, even though she was a white elite woman, you contextualize her life within, you know, the world, the Atlantic world of slavery and South Carolina. And I think, um, I think that's one of the best parts of the book, that you do a good job. Well, she well, commanded yeah. enslaved people. Um, and manage their labor no different than any, um, you know, elite male planter that I've ever studied. Uh, one of the questions about those homes that are still standing. Um, do you want to answer that now or do you want to? I, I could probably go, you want to go, you want me to go ahead and answer that now, Amy? It, ahead, it's yeah. probably a, uh, it's a quick, uh, maybe a quick answer. Her son, she had three children, Charles Coatsworth, Harriet and Thomas. Harriet's plantation was called Hampton. That was the principal residence that she had. And that's that's a national park site now. So you can go visit Hampton Plantation. And Hampton Plantation is where Eliza spent most of the last decade of her life. She was, her husband died um, in the late 50s. And so she lived the rest of her life, you know, 30 plus years, I guess, uh, independent. But the American Revolution and the occupation of South Carolina stripped her of that independence. And so when the British evacuated, you know, uh, Belmont, her, which had been her principal residence, had been burned. She had lost her uh, city estates or city houses. And so she moved in with Harriet and lived the last decade of her life there. That's still standing. Uh, her son, Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, owned one of the houses on Rainbow Row in Charleston. And then her son, Thomas, married very well uh, to uh, one sister. And then when she died, he married the other sister. And their home, Thomas's second wife's home that he lived in, is where the Spoleto Festival is uh, the headquarters for the planning of the Spoleto Festival. I can't remember the name of the street now. Uh, in Charleston, but those three houses are are still standing, and I think reflective of the incredible wealth that Eliza really built, and that her children extended uh, through, you know, resolve, through ambition, through entrepreneurship, and through slaveholding, always through slaveholding. Yes, I found that same thing with with Mary Willing Bird that it's hard to. All of the things that she, and I don't know if you feel this way about, I'm sure you must, but uh, that I feel like all the things she was really 
well known for parts of her life with, when she was married, that she was a great hostess. Um, but then later that she had transitioned her plantation into wheat, but those things could not have been done without okay. enslaved labor. She would not have been able to do all of those things. And I doubt Eliza would be able to drag birds from South Carolina <laughs> without an entourage. No, that, that, that's, that's absolutely right. Yeah, unpaid entourage, um, not to make it so glamorous. Um, one of the other things that we've, we've talked about, me and you, is that the fact that there's no, she has no portrait, which I think is so interesting about people of her status at that time. They all had their portraits done. And, you know, but she, at, at least you've never found one. Do you think one exists? And if it doesn't, why do you think that is? I do not believe there was a, a portrait. The Charleston Museum has some of Eliza's jewelry they have the salmon and cream dress. They have a pair of shoes. They have a silver tea service. They have the canopy of her bed, which by the way, was designed and di designed to represent and dyed with indigo, which tells you how important. So she will lay in bed at night and look up at the <laughs> canopy and she would see indigo plants dyed with indigo dye. So they have all those materials. The family was basically turned into refugees during the occupation of, of um, South Carolina. So the two brothers then were exiled to Philadelphia. Harriet and Eliza stayed behind. They weathered what was really a guerrilla in a civil war in South Carolina. Their estates were seized, their crops were burned, their, you know, wherever they moved, soldiers invaded. And yet they kept safe. Eliza's writings. So whatever else happened during all of that turmoil, they preserved the artifacts of her life and the written record of her life. All of the children had portraits done. Her husband had a portrait done. Um, I just simply believe if she had wanted to have a portrait done, she would have done it and people would have kept it. And if it couldn't have been kept, the family would have written about it being lost. They wrote about everything they lost during the Revolutionary War, including uh, many of her husband's papers. They had moved them to one of Thomas's estates so that they could be in safekeeping. And then the uh, British forces arrived there and they wrote with great lament about having lost their father's papers to a fire at that house. So, um, there's also a conversation among later generations of, of uh, Eliza's descendants saying that there was never any portrait done. So if somebody um, knows of one, I sure would love to uh, hear from you, but I just don't believe she ever had one made. And I believe that was a choice because everyone else in the family um, had one made. Yeah, I know. And for the Bird family um, that they wrote, I mean, these their portraits were passed down in wills. Like you could trace the, the portraits through wills. They talk about it when someone dies, that these portraits, like you're gonna get this portrait or this portrait was left in this plantation. And I think they kept close track of them. So I would agree. That's right. It's, it is a very important, um, uh, you know, family records. I mean, I think we think about family in the 21st century very differently than people thought about family in the 18th century and certainly different than how the elite planter class of North America thought about uh, family in the 18th century. And so, you know, they're already, as she, you know, reaches her mid 60s, her children are already curating the record of her life. And if there had been a portrait that had somehow been lost or misplaced, I believe they would have gone to great lengths to retrieve it. You know, it's so interesting and it kind of ties together two of the books you've written. Because I know in the Founders as Fathers, you talk a lot about how their papers are kept and actually, like, like you say, curated by their family or their wives after they die and then carefully placed into certain custody. Um, did you find, I actually have never asked you this question before, but have you, is that what happened with Eliza's papers? Or you said that the family preserved them, but how did they end up getting to be part of a public project? Uh, yeah, so, you know, it's no accident that we have all these writings from George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and John and Abigail Adams. 
people in North America who survived and certainly the leaders of the American Revolutionary Movement understood that they were living in a profoundly important moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, leading members of the founding generation believe they had an obligation to future generations to give them a record of their lives and to make that record an example so that the American experiment in representative democracy might survive over time. And so, you know, George Washington, when he resigns his commission, has sent over land three wagons full of paperwork so that it can be preserved. Late in their lives, after they retired from the presidency, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson began editorial projects in their homes and their families continued those. And though, you know, Eliza was not a politically prominent person, that was one hard limit on her life. She could not be directly involved in politics or in, I guess, represent, representative politics or in voting. She owned property and, uh, you know, she even wrote wills for people, but she could not be directly involved uh, in politics. So there was a limit to, you know, the, I guess, the significance and the scope of her writings, but her children were determined to protect those records. And in fact, you know, her son Charles Coatsworth Pinckney begins in, right after the um, right after the American Revolution to write people and to write his mother to get firsthand accounts of her indigo experiments. And he mm -hmm. turns those over to David Ramsey, who wrote the first history of the American Revolution, uh, and he wrote Eliza into that record. It was. Um, uh, simplified, I guess, an exaggerated version of her work with indigo experimentation. It got simplified into Eliza Lucas Pinckney invented indigo, which was not, <laughs> not the truth. Uh, but nevertheless, her, her children were very interested in preserving her materials. Um, and their children were very interested in preserving their materials. At some point, and I'm not sure how, I guess descendants moved about. Eliza's letter book that she started keeping when she was 17 years old got split up. And part of it is in uh, the South Carolina Historical Society collection at the College of Charleston, but other materials are at the Duke University uh, Special Collections Library. And Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, some of his materials are at Duke. So I'm not exactly sure how that happened, but at mm -hmm. some point, after you know protecting um, the documents for at least two or three generations, they turned them over to professional archivists and they preserved them for another century, I guess. Um, and then Connie and her team at uh, the University of South Carolina took those materials and made them digitally available for um, you know for, for any scholar or, or any person who wants to read, from you know their own hands, the lives of the Pinckney family, and they're also before they were digitized, they were published as a trans as a collection volume of printed type. Stuff. Well, the okay. letter Eliza's letter book was, oh, okay. um, and Harriet's recipe book was published in, in a book form. So part of Eliza, the part of Eliza's letter book, I believe I have this right. If there's an archivist from Charleston down there, you'll. Uh, in the um, group, you'll correct me uh, later on, but the South Carolina Historical Society part of it was published in a book by Elise Pinckney, who was a descendant uh, mm -hmm. of Eliza Lucas Pinckney, and then um, Harriet Pinckney O'Ree's recipe book was published as well, but, you know, the great majority of the Pinckney's materials um, were not available outside of archives until um, Connie's team began their work. And I love that they started with Eliza and Harriet. So the, the project began as the digital edition of the Eliza Lucas Pinckney and Harriet Pinckney Ori papers. And when they finished that, then they turned to the men of the family. And so there's an ongoing project called the Pinckney Digital Statesman Edition. I think I have that right. And it's Charles Coatsworth and Thomas and their cousin, Charles. It's usually the other way around, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. It, you know, the Washington papers are a good example of that. Like they're, they're now working on a Washington 
family papers collection, but for you know most of the life of the Was the modern Washington George Washington Papers Project and the one before that, it was all George all the time. <laughs> of course. So I think that's very interesting and leads me. You know, I guess I'd never thought about. I always imagined that the founding fathers intentionally and their families intentionally shaped their legacy. I think it's you know Thomas Jefferson burns his wife's letters because he doesn't want anyone to see what they say to each other. But I, so I would imagine it's the same for Eliza and her family, that they, they shaped her legacy. And you wonder, you know, what things maybe they left out or what you don't know. There must be little pockets of things. Interesting oh, absolutely. You know, there are all sorts of things that, um, that I'm not able to know. Um, but one really important difference between Eliza, and I don't know if you found this in the letters that you've been able to uh, search out for Mary Willing Bird. Washington and Jefferson um, and Madison were aware of their significance and they were aware that future generations would read their writings. And so they're self-editing as they're writing the materials. You know, for all of the tens of thousands of letters we have from George Washington, they're, they're just parts of his inner life that are unknowable uh, because so much of it is his life outward. And um, Eliza was either much more introspective or less concerned about a long, I mean, she wanted to keep the records, but maybe less concerned about a long term legacy. And so, you know, she writes about her concern about you know, being a good mother, uh, about being a good steward of uh, her family assets, about the challenges that she faced and the, you know, sort of grief uh, that she sometimes gave into uh, during the, the occupation of South Carolina. Uh, she wrote, when her husband died, she just fell apart completely. Um, and she wrote a lot about that, about the, the emotional ordeal and the difficulty of, of uh, facing his loss and living the rest of her life without the great love of her life. Um, so she wrote about that, but then she picked herself up because she had three little children that she had to raise as a single mother and a massive and complicated estate that, that she had to manage. And she wrote about those challenges. And so her the life that I was able to see, and I hope I did you know, um, justice to it in the book, but. I certainly saw was a much fuller life than than I was able to directly recover reading the papers of James Madison uh, or George Washington. No, I think that's exactly right. And I think I, I, I it's very interesting how you say she wasn't aware of her own significance, but I'm sure that's true. She probably thought nobody would live would be reading her papers or maybe you know, um, her descendants might have thought that, but we, you talk about, I know we're up, we've got to open it up for questions, um, but there's the, you mentioned in there that list that she makes every year and she reflects upon herself. I'm sure that was just for her eyes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, and maybe her children and grandchildren. So I, I'm sorry to cut into the conversation here, but we have loads of questions from the audience. Uh, they're, they're fascinated by, by this story, Lori, and um, have, uh, have submitted a number of questions to that Q&A feature there at the bottom. If you have any further questions, uh, please do submit them to Q&A. They tend to get lost in the chat, uh, so that's why we're trying to keep them separate here. But um, this first question comes from, from Emily in the audience, and she's curious about the concept of coverture and how it was applicable uh, to Eliza's life. How did it, how was it not in some ways because she didn't live necessarily um, the, the same life as other women, but she asked, was Eliza able to overcome coverture? Was that because of her father's trust? Okay, so I am so glad uh, that you asked that question. And let me just back up and say, Amy and I have seen some things pop up in the chat. So we answered a question or made a comment, but but if we didn't see it, we, we don't mean that that's not important or interesting. We just didn't see it because it, it pops up and goes. So Coverture, if anybody um, in the room doesn't know, was a legal doctrine that said that women were in effect covered by their fathers and then their husbands. So they didn't have a separate legal identity. And in some parts of British North America, that was supposed to mean that, you know, they couldn't appear in court 
uh, or if they appeared in court, that there were only certain roles that they could play, that they couldn't own property uh, on their own, um, or you know, sort of all sorts of limits on what they could do legally. And that was, in fact, an important part of law. In practice, it wasn't always imposed. And so Eliza um, bought and sold property. Uh, she wrote wills for her neighbors. Um, sometimes a neighbor would ask her to enter into to write a marriage arrange, a marriage settlement, and she would not do that because she knew that or that that might get contested in court and it might cause uh, her neighbor a problem. But a will she was willing to write because she knew that the check on uh, by the courts on a will would would not be all that stringent, and she could get away with that. Um, when her husband died, she was, I think she was 38 years old, 37 or 38 years old. She had three children. They had, I think, about a dozen uh, estates around the South Carolina Low Country. Uh, they have four or five houses in town, I mean, in, in Charlestown, um, s dozens of enslaved people. Her husband left everything to her and the minor children. And she was the guardian of those children and she was the executor of the will. So there were a few little debts that she had to pay, but otherwise she said she didn't even bother to execute the will. She, and she wrote about this uh, to a friend that, you know, that there is nobody, she said, to call me to account. And so the law would have said there that she could maybe she couldn't be the sole executor or there would have to be a secondary guardian or the will would have to be supervised by some male relative or whatnot but but that was not in fact what happened so one of the really important things i learned in um through her life in researching and writing this book is how limited law was when it came to confident and competent women like Eliza Lucas Pinckney. So her neighbors trusted her. Uh, she conducted international business uh, without any male managing or overseeing her work um, because the people who she uh, traded with knew that she was responsible, conscientious, uh, and successful. So I, I'm really glad you asked that question because we often think women in early America don't have any power because of the law of coverture and if you look closely, that's just not so. Thank you for that. Um, another question is, could you please talk about Eliza's a quote unquote different treatment of the enslaved people on her properties? Um, does she treat them differently? Does she educate them? Do you have any insights into that? Uh, sure. So when um, Eliza took over the management of her father's estates in South Carolina, there were three of them, and he was recalled back to uh, the family home in, in Antigua in the Caribbean. Um, she was responsible for the land, for the crops, and for the people who worked the land and produced the crops. Um, she behaved, as best I can discern, like any other planter in the colonial South. So Amy can maybe co-sign this with Mary Willingbird in Virginia. The institution of slavery works only because of the systemic threat and use of violence. And violence to the point of loss of life. So um, Eliza did not like uh, William Byrd, who uh, is in Mary Willingbird's family. William Byrd kept a log of the beatings that he inflicted. Eliza didn't do that, or if she did, it, it wasn't preserved. But there's no way that she could have um, succeeded with plantation agriculture without um, co-signing um, overseers, directing overseers to threaten and use violence against enslaved people. She did begin a, a program of trying to teach enslaved children how to read, not write, but read. Um, she was following there the um, advocacy of a, of a minister who came to South Carolina. I think his name was Alexander Garden, certainly Reverend Garden. 
um, who, who wanted to teach children, enslaved children to read, but principally so that they could read the Bible or help with maybe some administrative task within the household or for the family businesses. So sometimes people read about 18th century planters teaching, pe teaching enslaved people to read, uh, teaching them to write, teaching them about uh, the Christian faith. I don't think we ought to assume that that was ever out of a concern for the best interest of the people who were being enslaved. It was driven by the interest and the ambitions of the people who were doing the enslaving. I would also add that in the 1740s, evangelical Christians came into South Carolina and pointed out that slavery was immoral and unbecoming of all Christians. In the 1770s, um, leaders of the Patriot Movement in North America uh, came, came to argue that the institution of slavery could not be reconciled with the principles of representative democracy and the values espoused in the Declaration of Independence. In the 1780s and 90s, Mid-Atlantic and New England states moved toward gradual emancipation laws. Eliza lived through all of that and never once questioned um, her own lifelong immersion in slaveholding. So just despite there were, despite the fact that there were religious, political, and legal challenges to slavery in her lifetime. She remained a, a, a lifelong slaveholder. And she, when she went to Philadelphia in uh, 1790 for breast cancer treatment, Philadelphia was the best place to go in the whole country if you were suffering from cancer. And she had breast cancer and her children sent her there. She went with enslaved women who tended to her at the end of her life. So, you know, the beginning of her life in Antigua was surrounded by enslaved Black women caring for her. And the end of her life in Philadelphia, she was again surrounded by enslaved Black women forced to care for her. Can I interject too? That that's the same picture that Annette Gordon Reed paints about Thomas Jefferson and the Hemis of Monticello, that, you know, the, the guy, the enslaved person who dug Jefferson's grave was someone who had been with him his whole life. And I think in that way, you talk about Eliza Lucas Pinky as being um, a planter patriarch or as being, you know, um, not that different from men. And I think in that is another way that that's true. Yes. Um, there's another question from someone, I, I hope you know, because they send hugs and kisses, um, <laughs> Deborah Blackwell. Um, oh my good, hi Deborah, Debbie. <laughs> And um, the, the question she submitted was, what do you think uh, that you were able to capture in your, in your biography of, of Pinckney that previous biographies missed or did not quite understand about her? For, for both of you, do you think that there are things that scholars in general get wrong about colonial era women in attempting to write their histories? So uh, thank you so much and hugs right back to you, sweet friend. Um, I think, um, well, there had never been a scholarly biography of Eliza Lucas Pinckney before I wrote this. It's, it's shocking to me because she'd been the subject of, um, you know, radio shows in the 1920s. There's a coloring book about Eliza uh, Lucas Pinckney. She'd been subject to plays and, uh, you know, there's a very um, well-regarded historical novel called Indigo Girl, I think. Um, some of the South Carolina people will know about that. But I believe mine is the first scholarly biography. I think the biggest misperception that people have about women in colonial America is they read back into the 18th century and even the 17th century, the very specific moment in the antebellum period in, among middle-class white Americans where they embraced at least an ideal of separate spheres, that men were supposed to do the work and women were supposed to be at home and they live completely separate and distinct lives and women were always subordinate to men uh, and highly maternal and focused on that and, you know, sort of live their best lives by fulfilling these uh, cultural ideals. And 
you know, I haven't studied that period, so I'm not even sure how much it applies to middle class um, white uh, Christian women in New England. But it definitely cannot be pushed back into the 18th century. Definitely does not work to think about men and women having these rigid boundaries uh, about what they could do um, and be. And Eliza reflects that, I think. Um, you know, Mary Willing Bird reflects that. If you look closely, you'll see all sorts of women. You know, Abigail Adams, was she some demure, deferential, uh, you know, leaving John to all of the important business of the world? No. And even Martha Washington, who turned over her estate when she married George Washington, had before they married very capably run uh, the Custis estate. And so I think if we look, we'll see lots of women in the 17th and 18th century um, doing things very different from what we imagine if we're thinking about the 19th century. I would agree. Uh, Lori, check my answer. No, <laughs> <laughs> that was what I was going to say. But I would agree. I think that it's about the, the intellect. People had faith in the intellect of women at the time in a way that they didn't by the 19th century when separate spheres emerges, that they had confidence in women's ability to do things they may have thought they were physically weaker, but morally and intellectually, they did not think that. And that comes later with separate spheres in the 19th century. I, we have talked about that a lot. It's something we were surprised to find when we started our research, because we had always heard you know, with the same things that everybody else did, because there's not that much research on women in the revolutionary era. That's right. Well, I want to thank you both for, for being here and um, for taking the time to answer these questions. In fact, I want to thank all of you for, for joining us here today. And just a reminder that the presentation is being recorded and it'll be available on the museum's YouTube channel for viewing later this week. Thank you again to our generous sponsor, Time Warner Media and our co-presenter for this month's programming, DC Public Library. If you enjoyed this Sundays at Home presentation, then we encourage you to join us again on Wednesday, March 23rd, as we continue our Women's History Month celebration of women's lives and impact with NWHM presents a virtual conversation with Indra Nui, a, a former PepsiCo CEO and chairperson, as well as author of My Life in Full, Work, Family, and Our Future. That'll be at 6 p.m. Eastern time. For, excuse me, for a full listing of upcoming programs and for registration information, please visit the public programs and events tab at www.womenshistory.org. All events are free, but advanced registration is required. Thank you again, Lori. Thank you, Amy, for joining us today. We hope to see all of you back again soon. And until next time we meet, do stay uh, safe and healthy. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us.